Dirt Tracks is sponsored by Polaris, think outside. Can-Am, time for some off-road living. And by Yamaha, revs your heart. Twenty-five years is a long time, it's a quarter century, and for anyone familiar with dirt tracks or particularly our YouTube channel, you know how much I love the Grizzly lineup. Heck, I've owned two of these machines as my personal ATVs over the years. Are they the fastest? No, but that's never really been their claim. However, the Grizzly rides and handles amazingly well, and its reputation for quality, durability, and reliability is unmatched. We were recently invited to Colorado by Yamaha to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Grizzly and ride the trails in the Rampart Range Recreational Park located in the Pike San Isabel National Forest, which is about 35 miles southwest of Denver. Narrow paths winding through the mountainous terrain, reaching elevations of nearly 9,000 feet at the most scenic points. This wasn't side-by-side -side country, folks, and it was the perfect place for the Grizzly to showcase its strengths. I hear so much chatter and read so many comments about how badly Yamaha needs an 850 twin in its lineup, and I admit, I'm guilty of throwing gas on that flame too. But the reality is, if Yamaha did introduce a larger displacement engine in its Grizzly lineup, there's got to be a place for this current 686cc single. Its power was perfect for this trail system, and I honestly feel like a more powerful engine would have been too much for where we rode. I know it sounds stupid and I do actually hear myself saying it, but the reality is feathering the throttle on a 1000cc V-twin all day would have been maddening on these trails. And one blip from a too itchy throttle thumb could have sent a bigger bore ATV off the side of the mountain. The power out of the Grizzly 686 is manageable and predictable, and clutching from Yamaha's Ultramatic CVT is smooth and linear and never skipped a beat the entire day. I've been lucky enough to get some seat time on the 25th anniversary edition of the Grizzly SE following Luke's test ride this past fall. And as I've mentioned in my past review of the Grizzly SE, I'm not the biggest fan of the Max's Zillas for trail riding. Thankfully, Yamaha outfitted my Grizzly with 28-inch GBC Grim Reaper tires which best suited the type of terrain we were riding on, which consisted of loose pebbly dirt and rocky and aggressive hill climbs. Honestly, this tire is a much better choice for the SE, and I have to wonder if we'll be seeing it on all SEs next season. While here, I was able to sit down with Pat Biolsi, ATV and side-by-side -side testing manager for Yamaha Motor Corporation USA, to discuss key milestones in the 25-year history of the Grizzly, dating back to the 1998 Grizzly 600, which was the highest displacement ATV at the time. It wasn't just power that made the Grizzly stand out, and its innovations helped shape the ATV industry and started the Grizzly's journey towards this 25-year legacy. Yamaha's belt durability is legendary, and a lot of that credit goes directly to its Ultramatic CVT. Yeah, the original Grizzly 600, you know, of course it was the biggest uh, displacement ATV at the time, 600 cc's. It was air and oil cooled back then, uh, but probably the most lasting uh, revolutionary change that was really made and helped the Grizzly live on for 25 years was the Ultramatic system. Belt durability was the number one problem that we really wanted to solve with the Ultramatic system. So how did it solve that? With constant belt tension. How did we achieve constant belt tension? By putting a centrifugal clutch, which we were very familiar with. All of our semi-automatic ATVs have some version of a centrifugal clutch inside the motor. And we added that to our system and that takes all the abuse. Ride in high range, low range, pull things, go up steep hills, 
and you really have that constant belt tension, keeps the belt temperature down and enhances that durability and really meets people's expectations. And that system has carried on for 25 years. Apart from extending belt life, Yamaha's Ultramatic transmission adds to the ride experience with its use of a Sprague clutch, which solves the problem of engine braking. Yeah, the second key problem that Ultramatic solved was engine braking. So the Sprague clutch, or the one-way bearing that's in the Ultramatic system, it reconnects the engine to the drive line, where a lot of the other typical CVT systems of the time, and still to this day, um, they separate. When engine RPM drops below uh, wheel speed, it actually disengages and feels like it was popped in a neutral. If you're in four-wheel drive, you get four-wheel engine braking because of that one-way bearing or that Sprague clutch. A lot of the other systems out there, they don't do that even to this day, 25 years later. So again, the one-way bearing and the strip wheel clutch, those two key components of Ultramatic have helped Grizzly carry on for 25 years. Dirt Tracks is sponsored by Hercules Tire. Ride on our strength. In 2002, the Grizzly saw its next big move up the evolutionary ladder with the introduction of the 660 single, along with independent rear suspension. So going to the 2002 model year, we launched the Grizzly 660. There's a couple key uh, innovations for the 660. Uh, number one was independent rear suspension. The previous Grizzly 600 was a solid axle rear suspension. IRS was a big deal. It really enhanced traction, it enhanced comfort. Uh, terrain ability was drastically improved. This was a big year for the Grizzly because not only did we see a new engine and IRS, but we also saw the enhancement of its on-command system with the introduction of front diff lock. The other key component was enhancing of the on-command system, which we did have on the Grizzly 600, the switchable two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive. But the 600 had four-wheel drive limited slip only. Um, but the 660, we added a front differential lock. So you had three choices now, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive limited slip, and now diff lock with the Grizzly 660. And that was huge, really a huge percentage of the time. Most customers are perfectly happy with it. It works in a variety of situations, but there's a couple, you know, when you're doing any steep technical terrain where you really you know as soon as that tire touches the ground you want to make sure it's grabbing the same speed and the same amount of torque as the other side the front diff lock does that deep mud steep technical terrain especially if one tire maybe is going to get light or maybe even come off the ground and you really want to make sure when that other tire touches the ground that it's pulling at the same amount of torque as the other side that's where front differential lock was key and that was a big enhancement for the 660. the second point of course it was liquid cooled now um, slightly bigger displacement but uh, the on-command system and independent rear suspension, those were the key innovations for the Grizzly 660. In 2007, Yamaha squeezed a bit more juice into the Grizzly with the introduction of its now iconic fuel-injected 686cc single-cylinder engine. Of course, with the Grizzly 700, it really went from a 660 to a 686cc engine. Uh, it was single overhead cam, it was tilted forward, and we really wanted to make that big bore feel from the engine. We didn't want the engine to really impact the handling of the character of the vehicle. So we tilted the cylinder forward. We kept the head very compact and low and as centralized as possible. It carries over all the great innovations we made with the 600 and the 660. On-command system is the same. Independent rear suspension is carried over now. We've enhanced the chassis a little bit, new suspension settings and things like that. But really the big things that were introduced with the Grizzly 700, of course, was fuel injection. That was a big one. Uh, again, riding at elevation like we are today, that makes a huge difference. Going from uh, lower elevations to higher elevations, not having to rejet, having it work from you know 7,000 to 9,000 feet like we are today, that's a huge enhancement. 2007 was a big year, not just for the Grizzly, but for the entire ATV industry, because not only did Yamaha introduce a larger displacement fuel injected engine, they also introduced an industry first, electronic power steering. GPS was a massive innovation for off-road. Now all of a sudden you could ride longer and more aggressively than ever before while reducing fatigue in your arms and shoulders. Slow speed navigation was as smooth as a watercraft and the rider was simultaneously insulated from the trail while never feeling more connected to it than ever before. 
something we really focused on during the development of that power steering system is that we had that balance of positive and negative feedback. You want to be able to feel what the tires are doing, but of course, lighten the steering effort and reduce negative feedback. When you hit that trail obstacle, you know, the rock, the tree root in the trail, it acts like a steering damper and really, uh, again, enhances people's ability to ride all day. The other key thing we did with the Grizzly 700 was we moved the fuel tank up from its traditional location up on top to down between the frame rails and move the filler neck as well so that all that weight of the fuel was in a lower, more centralized location. So that was a huge difference for the Grizzly 700 is it had a lot of power, uh, but it was very smooth, very manageable. And of course, all the weight was as centralized as possible. Dirt Tracks is sponsored by Princess Auto. Make it work. 2016 saw the next big update for the Grizzly, featuring a complete bodywork overhaul that now better suited its aggressive legacy, along with a non-Yamaha built 708cc single developed in partnership with Subaru, and this made room for the smaller stature Kodiak. This also drew a clear line to differentiate these two similarly powered units within Yamaha's ATV lineup. There was a couple of key points, especially when we introduced the Kodiak 700, where Grizzly styling really took a, a slightly different direction, a much more aggressive, more recreation-focused direction. Um, the engines are the same between the Kodiak 700 and the Grizzly 700, but there's a much different concept there. The Kodiak 700 is smaller, lower to the ground, lower seat height, a little bit more narrow track width, uh, smaller tires, a 25-inch tire versus the 26 and the 27 inch tire now on the Grizzly 700, but it's uh, bigger, higher shoulders on the fenders, taller seat height, it's thicker, taller handlebars. It really is uh, a lot of fun to ride. You can sit or stand, um, you know, trail whoops and things like that, like we have here in the Western US. You wanna get up off the seat and drive it or ride it in a way that's a little bit more sporty, a little bit more recreation focused, whereas the Kodiak's again, a little bit more utility focused uh, around the farm, around the property and uh, Grizzly styling is part of that concept. That 708 only lasted a few seasons until Yamaha brought back the 686 in the Grizzly, which is pretty much the model we see today. That said, I had a 2016 Grizzly and I loved it. And those updates to its bodywork made it stand out amongst its competition. Styling, the Grizzly styling is really a key part of its concept in that recreation focused direction. Handling character of the Grizzly just made uh, people comfortable in a wide variety of situations, technical, tight terrain, twisty terrain. The R chassis really shines in those situations. Who knows what the future of the Grizzly will hold, or what Yamaha's next big innovation will be. Will we see a Grizzly cross country? Or what about a factory mutter? Or what about a two-up? Maybe they'll bring us that 850 twin. Regardless of what we see from this line, all of us here at Dirt Tracks extend our heartfelt congratulations to Yamaha for 25 years of the Grizzly, and look forward to another 25 years to come. Dirt Tracks has been sponsored by Kawasaki. Let the good times roll. MBRP Performance Exhaust, built for the victory lap. And by Mad Ramps, leave the trailer and go. In a previous episode, we met Hunter Lovelace and got to check out his pretty impressive collection of unique and different restored sport ATVs. In this week's episode, we're gonna see his prized possession, his Honda 250R. Whenever I buy anything or like whenever I look at anything that I want to restore, you have to look for like the potential as what you can make out of it. I got an 86 TRX 250R uh, and I started restoring that because I just seen so many different 
possibilities as to what I could make something. This was your first build? It was, it was okay. my first build, 100%. Go through for me what you did to it and what it's built from now. What, what is it, what did you do and, and how did it start, I guess? Yeah, so it started out as a, just basically a used and abused 1986 TRX 250R. I bought it out of uh, out of Michigan, actually. When we got it, it was a running machine that I was, I was still young at the time, so I was still able to just kind of ride around on it, but then having the passion for all like the, the custom stuff and just the the off the one-off builds, I wanted to do something special with it. Powder coated the frame. And then basically the search started for all the cool one-off trick parts for it. Um, the extended A-arms, suspension, just all the cool parts that uh, that everybody everybody likes to see, especially on a 250R, because yep. the aftermarket support still to this day is insane crazy. for a TRX 250R. That's where it started with though. And um, like, so, in terms of being stock, like the swing arms changed, the arms are changed. What is stock? It looks like the foot pegs are stock. The motor is fairly stock. Okay. Um, being being that we, I built it at a younger age, um, I really didn't didn't go too crazy in the power department. Mm -hmm. um, kind of just we put a, we redid the top end. I mean, it's all stock porting, stock stroke. It's it's all it's all mild that way. Um, but the uh, as far as everything else goes, it's pretty custom. Yeah, I mean, it looks custom. beautiful. Yeah, it, uh, it it rides amazing too. I mean, the suspension works really, really well on it. I'm looking at this motor. This motor looks brand new. So you must have had the cases powder coated as well? Yeah, actually, believe it or not, the um, the bottom end actually is untouched. So like we, this hasn't been done anything? So what I did, the, the bottom end, the bearings, the, the crank, everything was still all together. When we had it apart, we actually, I taped off every single bolt and I actually painted that that motor. Seriously? With an engine enamel, yes. Really? Yeah. Taped off every bolt, didn't take it apart? No. <laughs> Holy so crap, that's all so those weird. bolts, I have never, they have never been apart. That, and no I was way. able to find a paint that was very, very close to the 86, um, the color that was required wow. on that motor. Nice job. Yeah, so. I would never, not in a million years would I have guessed that that you would say that. Yeah, that's, that's wild. That's what I did there. Um, just because we didn't, I didn't, there was no need to pull it apart. Like mm -hmm. the, the bottom end is, uh, was in amazing shape. Suspension wise, what have you got for shocks? So it's got plus two Janssen A arms with works suspension on it. They were, uh, they were the, the, the shock company to go with back in the day. Yep. I mean, to be completely honest, they don't work anywhere near like the standards of today's suspension companies. That's what that's what a lot of racers used back in the day. So I, I was- I remember uh, looking through dirt wheels and seeing the ads for work suspension. Oh yeah, work suspension yeah. was, that was it. So I was, uh, I found those and I restored those. I had all new internals put, th put in them. Um, springs were powder coated because they're a triple rate spring. Oh yeah, look at so that. So it's all, all, each one of those is a different spring, starting from the black, white, and blue. So I powder coated them, and then uh, out back I put um, an Elka uh, dual rates shock in the back, okay. and that actually made a world of a difference. Like you, you did a frame up. I did a frame up, like right down to like welding gussets into the frame okay. to, to strengthen the frame. Did um, you have some of the parts before you started the build, no. or did you do the frame and then build it up as basically, you collected parts? Basically, build it up as I collected parts. Honestly, when I built this back in probably about. 2014-ish, parts were a lot easier to find. Than they are now. Than they are now. If you could change anything, what would you change? There's a few things I would change. Yeah. Looking back at it now with the experience I've had with restoring stuff, there is a few things that I would change, but honestly, it's not, there's nothing that I can't change easy enough. Like the whole like appeal, the color scheme, everything, I still like it. Um, being that we rebuilt the motor, I do kind of wish we put a bit more in it. Like I wish I put like a 330 cylinder or something in it, uh, which, but again, that's easy enough to do. Sure. Like I can easy enough get back in there and do it, so. If you can look back, how many years ago was that? 2014, so we're looking at- About uh, 10 years, close to 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, close to 10 years ago. Yeah. You can look back on a build you, ten, you did 10 years ago and say, you know what? I wouldn't change a lot. That was a really good build. Yeah. So tell me about, what this bike means to you means a lot to me um it's like i this this thing will go to the grave with me for yeah. sure it's never ever for sale just all the hours that i put into building it and the passion that it's it, it got me into mm -hmm. it's uh it means a lot to me it means more to me than any other 
any other machine. I think the coolest thing about it is well, this is what ignited the passion in you to keep going and then look where it's ended up, right? And, yeah, and it's yeah. not stopping. That's the problem. <laughs> I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Well, thanks for the tour of this bike. That was really interesting and it's something I know our viewers are going to just go crazy for because here in Canada, as you found out when you tried to find one, there's just not a lot of them here. No, and there's so not. So being able to see one up close in person, one that's been very, very nicely restored slash modified is something that a lot of Canadians don't get to see. All the iconic quads in the world, this would be number one on the list. Yes. Okay. Well, listen, thanks, man. That was a really, really interesting uh, a walk around of this vehicle. And we've got more coming from you in the future. Yes. So yes. this isn't the last one. We got um, lots of stuff. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be good. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch up with you on the next one. Absolutely. Thanks, man.